But where are all of the abandoned buildings? That was my logic as a 17-year-old. It was more or less my first time in a cosmopolitan city at this scale in 2002, driving down Young Street, which from the north suburbs of Toronto all the way through uptown, midtown, downtown, is a very cosmopolitan, very thriving street. It's a commercial drag with every kind of business on it, boutiques, coffee shops, and people. Lots of people that want to be in that area that support those businesses. And for me, that was seemingly like what it should have been familiar, but was a very different narrative from what I knew of cities growing up just 60 miles south as the crow flies in a lower middle class neighborhood just outside of Buffalo, where my typical, my typical narrative of what cities was is that they didn't grow, they only shrank, that when I had my earliest memories going down to Sesame Street on Broadway downtown and coming up on Main Street, that I saw boarded up businesses because businesses only closed, they didn't open, and that there was not the type of energy where people wanted to be into, in this place. My, my parents sold their house in 1999 for the same price they bought it for in 1989. After a year of depreciation or appreciation and property taxes and investments into the house and inflation. And from having this as my memory, from being three or four years old, pretty much all the way through my mid-20s, I thought that meant that I wasn't gonna get to stay. I wasn't get to, gonna get to be in the place that I wanted to be. I wasn't gonna get to stay with my family. That if I wanted a job in advertising or marketing, which I was looking for in my mid-20s, that I was gonna have to move to one of these other cities, go to a different place. And so not only did that mean leaving my family and friends and the place that I wanted to be at, but I felt like I was gonna be part of the problem and not part of the solution that I wanted to be a part of. So I got really curious because we hear like a tale of two Americas sometimes. One that's largely coastal and cosmopolitan, one that's largely interior and poor. And while this doesn't get into all of the geopolitical, I just wanted to take a look at what's going on in these two different groups. And these two different groups that I chose are somewhat random, I could have picked smaller towns and cities. I could have picked faster growing cities like Austin and Denver and Dallas. But I chose to pick sort of like the seven cities that we kind of know as established, expensive cosmopolitan cities of North America. And seven, the seven main cities that we think of when we think of the Rust Belt. Now maybe not everybody uses the term Rust Belt, but I do. I lived there my whole life and I use it affectionately. And I wanted to know what was going on in these two different groups because they each have at least one pretty big problem that is very different from the other and I wanted to see if they could solve each other. Because if you live in any of our expensive cities or you have or you've talked to your Lyft driver the last time that you were there, they will tell you that the common woman and man cannot afford to live in these places. The average price of a home is more than three quarters of a million dollars. 600% more expensive than it is in our affordable cities. The median price of rent in these cities is $2,700 a month, $3,400 a month in New York City, $3,800 a month in San Francisco. Now this is much different from our affordable cities where you can get a nice apartment in Buffalo for under a grand, but our affordable cities have a different problem. Because while rent is only about a third of what it is in our expensive cities, and the, the price of homes is 600% cheaper than it is in our expensive cities. There are fewer people making less money. The average household income in our affordable cities is half of what it is in our expensive cities. And that's true for our top 20% wage earners as well. They're making half of what the top 20% wage earners are in our expensive cities. What I want to know is what if there is a way where we could alleviate some of the cost burden 
and congestion and demand in our expensive cities and use that as economic development and investment in our affordable cities that need more going on for their local tax base, for their local business economy? What if there was a way to be able to sol use one challenge to solve the other? Because for all of recent history, you pretty much had to pick your poison. Do I want to make less money and earn less money? Or do I want to make more money and pay out the WAS? So maybe we could get a big company to move from, say, you know what? Long Island City is already pretty expensive. The Washington, D.C. area is already pretty congested. Maybe we could put some of that investment into St. Louis. Except if we look at our expensive cities, plus Seattle, the original headquarters, six of the seven are on Amazon's top 20 list. And of our affordable cities that have the space for this, that would really benefit from it, only the city that we're in right now, Pittsburgh, made that list. Maybe it's tough for Amazon to be able to convince 20,000 people to move to St. Louis, because maybe they don't get it. A lot of these solutions have been top down. And we can see that a lot of these large scale solutions that at best, they're having mixed results because they haven't overturned the overall trend. The overall trend is that our expensive cities are getting more expensive and they're still growing really quickly. 11% from 2010 to 2017. And our affordable cities are still shrinking. Things look way better here in Pittsburgh and Buffalo and Cleveland than they did 20 years ago. But the fact is that the net population of almost all these cities is still declining, albeit at a much slower rate than the double digit decre decreases that they were seeing for about half a century. So if Amazon hasn't done it yet, or if rent control, or if public-private partnerships that give a ton of economic incentives to big companies hasn't worked yet, or best has had mixed results, what could be a solution that we could scale, but didn't necessarily have to scale? Well, at this time, we are seeing one of the biggest revolutions ever in the history of how human beings earn their livelihood. Through all of human history, we have had to live where we work. The fisherman lives by the sea, farmer lives by the field, the factory worker lives in an urban area where they can easily be hauled in and out every day to go to the factory. But today, if we have a good internet connection and a smartphone, we can ostensibly earn money from just about anywhere and live just about anywhere else. And this is only, this is only growing. If we, look at our, if we look at remote work, and some of the best data that I found was from four years ago, it's up 115% from the decade previously. There's four million people working from home now. That's 3% of the US workforce. And it's only growing up. So while it would be great if a major company would say, our, most of our employees are cost burdened here. Maybe there's other places that have the infrastructure that could really benefit from this. But one person can say, you know what? I want to make San Francisco money and buy a mansion in Detroit on auction for $1,000. One person can start a software as a service product. One person can start a marketing firm that specializes in one vertical. One person can negotiate a remote work job from their current employer. One person can apply for a remote work position instead of having to relocate and one person can develop an e-commerce platform so that they're selling to the entire world and their money comes into their city from their entire world as opposed to the five mile radius that they're selling to right now. And I know that, and if they want to, they can even come to an amazing, gorgeous, northeast city that I've never been to, by the way. I've never been to Pittsburgh before this weekend. And they can get an Airbnb here, like I did, in the urban core of a gorgeous northeast city for $55 a night, 
for three people after taxes because we know what the quality of life is here. And when we're looking at large scale solutions so far is that for, for most part, we've seen that economic opportunity trumps quality of life when people have to make that choice. But what if they didn't have to make that choice? Because we know what exists in these cities. And part of the reason why I chose these seven cities of the Rust Belt is just largely because they have many of the cultural amenities and the infrastructure that people in our larger cities might be accustomed to. And I know that this is all possible because I never got that marketing or advertising job. I couldn't. So I started my own company. And it's a marketing firm that specializes in one vertical. And we charge a price premium because we're specialized in one expertise. And because our clients come from Seattle and San Francisco and Toronto and New York and New Jersey and Connecticut and Dallas and many other places. And our expensive city clients don't get the Buffalo discount, didn't have to choose between a good career or a pay cut or the livability or the mobility that another city might have to offer. For the first time in human history, we can have our cake and eat it too. And I didn't have to leave my family either. I didn't have to leave my friends. And I got to be a part of the solution that I always wanted to be a part of. Because instead of competing for those few scarce jobs or that tiny little piece of the pie with every other little advertising agency in my small city, I'm not taking that away from anybody else now. I'm bringing money in. This opportunity to import money, to escape being cost burdened, to alleviate the congestion of large cities, and to invest in the economic development of the cities that have the infrastructure and the bones and the appeal that we love so much is available to us now at a solution that can scale for as many people as want to, but doesn't have to scale, isn't dependent on anything else. This is available to all of us and to these places now because remote work gave us and them the economic opportunity that nobody else did.